and welcome to uh, Human Biology. This is Biology 150. My name is Jonathan Hopper and I'll be your professor this time through. Now, speaking of which, uh, I feel like the best place to start a conversation like this is who am I and why should you care? Because let's be honest with ourselves, they could have some random person come wandering up here to do this for you and read off of a text in front of them and probably get by decently. But the reality is uh, that you are currently viewing video from a pretty intensive, hardcore research scientist of the past, if you will. Uh, it's been several years since I've done it, but I have, uh, I've worked from the tops of mountains to cave streams to awful swamps, uh, doing some really amazing uh, freshwater biological research. And I have been teaching classes of an anatomical nature for more than 10 years now. So it's been quite a while. I really enjoy myself. I hope that you will see that. And I hope that by comparison, you also begin to enjoy this stuff. So my name is Jonathan Hopper. The best way to get in touch with me is probably via email or by your Canvas inboxing function. You may use that as well. Um, my office is 2506 here in this building, and here is my office phone number. Ignore these office hours. They are not correct and will be updated. Uh, now, before I go any further, if you need to get in touch with me, I'm going to be doing Zoom meetings online. You can expect announcements coming up very soon about when those Zoom meetings will be. If you're not terribly familiar with Zoom, it's a very simple process. You simply click a link I give you and it does all the rest and it'll pull up and you can talk to me face to face about anything you got problems with. So that's coming. Now, part two of this quick little conversation is, this is not the best way to teach class like this. Personal opinion, not the best way to do it. But we're going to make the best of this situation as we possibly can, and uh, hopefully you're going to enjoy yourself. All right, all right. Now, parting comment here. I try my best to make these video lectures concise. They may not always be concise, but I try hard to. You try hard to make them concise because nobody wants to log on and see a two-hour video about whatever uh, they're supposed to watch and learn from. So I try to make these short, okay? Uh, that being said, you will witness me skipping over things here and there, and if I skip over it, that probably means you don't need to worry about it. But if it's something I sit and I harp on for endless hours, you should probably know more about it than otherwise, okay? So I'm certainly going to be kind of skipping through things. I'm not here to play games with you. If I tell you something's important, that means it's important. If I tell you something's not important, you should probably ignore it, okay? Uh, just the nature of this class, I'm going to cut some stuff out because I want to make these lectures short so that you can watch it and get through it and not have to, you know, sit and dwell on something for hours and hours and hours. Now, that being said, uh, I front load this class. So there's more material at the beginning than there is at the end. Uh, the idea is at the beginning, I have to kind of coax you into some knowledge before we can get to where we're going at the end. So uh, prepare yourselves. The first lectures are a good bit longer. And then as we proceed, the lectures get shorter and shorter and shorter. Let's hope that you've looked at your syllabus. If you haven't, go look at your official syllabus or go to the module section of Canvas and uh, that's probably where you're seeing this video, and look at the class calendar. We're gonna do two lectures and a test. Two lectures and a test. All right, let's get started. All right, <clears throat> what is biology? What is biology? Uh, here, for me, I just break this down in Latin, okay? Biology is the scientific study of life. Bios is life, and anything that's ology, ology is a study of. So biology is the scientific study of life. That's our good book definition. Now, all living things share a given set of characteristics that designates them as living things. COVID-19, not a living thing. It's a virus because it lacks some of these, okay? living things share a certain set of characteristics. And I believe I go through and I highlight these continuously, but you, you'll get my point. Living things are organized, 
okay? Organized from an atom up to a biosphere. As you can see here, you are an organism. Inside of you are many organ systems. Those organ systems, like your digestive system, will have multiple different organs interiorly. We are organized, okay? We are organized. Internally, we are organized. Your brain has a job to do and your heart has a job to do. They work with one another, but they are different. We are organized. We use materials and energy. Uh, the idea here is as follows. You got up this morning and probably had some sort of food. Uh, my wife made my daughter, I have three children by the way, you'll be hearing all about them as we progress. My wife got up and made my daughter a Belgian waffle this morning and she hated it. So I ate that Belgian waffle because somebody had to do it. Now, that Belgian waffle is made out of grains. Those grains are uh, photosynthetic. They get their energy from the sun. We use materials and energy from the sun. We have to consume things in order to survive. All living things must utilize materials and energy, even plants, okay? They're getting their energy from sunlight. You're getting your energy from a cow when you eat a hamburger, okay? It's, it's the same concept. We require materials and energy from the world around us. Uh, we must maintain relatively constant our internal environment. That's a fancy, well, that's a simple way of saying a fancier thing referred to as being homeostatically balanced. We must maintain homeostasis in order to survive. Now, what the heck does that mean, okay? Uh, your core body temperature, probably around 98.6 degrees. You've heard this. In fact, I, I'm willing to bet all of us have had to walk through some sort of temperature scanner in the last few months uh, to be able to get into a business or what have you, okay? Uh, your core temperature should be around 98.6 degrees. If it goes up too high or down too low, that could be very detrimental to your health. You could die, all right? We must maintain relatively constant our internal environment. Think about uh, diabetes and blood sugar, okay? If your blood sugar levels go up too high or down too low, that can be quite dangerous. We must maintain relatively constant our internal environment. You, I mean, you, you can even drink too much water and, and dilute your blood to a point that it can't carry oxygen and die. Like, this is very important. All right, uh, we respond to internal and external stimulation. Uh, <clears throat> I sense that I have not had lunch. It's currently like noon 30 or so for me. Uh, and I sense that I have not had lunch, I'm hungry, okay? I will go and get food after we're done here. That is me sensing an internal stimulus and then responding to it. Alternatively, if I grab a hot pan, I'm gonna let go of that thing very quickly. That is me sensing an external stimulation and responding to it. We must sense and respond to stimuli. Sense and respond to stimuli. All living things do this. All living things. Even the most simplistic living organisms are capable of this process. Um, very simple photosynthetic algae, for example, uh, display this process called, oh, these little tidbits I give you. Like this is what you might see on an exam. What I'm about to give you Again, first day of class, I'm going to tell you this, these things. This is why this is going to take forever. Um, then I will expand upon that further uh, just to help you understand. All right. It's very simple photosynthetic algae displays a process called positive phototaxis. Uh, positive means towards, photo means light, taxis means travel or to move. Uh, what they will do is they will move up a water column in order to uh, have better access to sunlight so that they can photosynthesize, so that they can make energy. Respond to stimulation. Living things must reproduce. <clears throat> Let me try again. Living things must reproduce and grow. In order to be living, we must reproduce and grow. Uh, unfortunately, folks, we all have a shelf life. We will die one day, all right? And if we don't reproduce ourselves, then in about 30 years, well, longer than that, in not terribly long on the grand scheme of things, there will be no more humans, okay? We must reproduce and then grow larger in order to propagate our species. And that's the same with any living thing. They must reproduce, grow larger, and reproduce again. 
Okay, that is the whole idea here, is this is what is required for us to be considered living things. We must have the ability to change over time. You see this with all living things. Think about a butterfly. That butterfly did not look like a butterfly earlier in its lifespan. Starts out as an egg, hatches into a larval form, then it must pupate, and then it emerges as a sexually active adult. Don't laugh, we do the same thing, okay? Uh, the only variation here is that egg is inside a mom. Mom gives birth to a live offspring. That live offspring goes through a series of changes culminating in puberty, leading to a sexually capable, reproductively active offspring, which is capable of propagating a species, thus being living, okay? These are the characteristics of living things. And it's amazing, very cool. All right, let's proceed. So I gotta throw some terms at you here, and you gotta learn these terms, man. These, these are important things. You're gonna be hearing me say this stuff throughout the semester. And uh, this will include as follows. In the world around you, there are autotrophs and there are heterotrophs. Autotrophs are considered primary producers, ergo, they're photosynthetic. Heterotrophs are considered secondary producers, ergo, they utilize cellular respiration. Now, what, all, what, what does all this mean? Uh, autotrophic means self-feeding. Trophos is to feed. Uh, autotrophic is self-feeding. What kind of organisms feed themselves? Those which are photosynthetic. Those which are primary producers. Plants, algae, anything capable of photosynthesis. Okay, Anything capable of photosynthesis would be considered autotrophic. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, good old fashioned plants. And by comparison, let's talk a little bit about the cellular respiration. Uh, this would be heterotrophic. You are a heterotroph. You don't feed off of sunlight, no. You feed off of hamburgers, okay? And that hamburger is uh, you consuming primary production in essence, in, in some ways, okay? Uh, think about having a salad, that might be a better way to look at this. You are secondarily producing you're using primary production to grow larger. You're a heterotroph. Your deer here is doing this. A hawk that eats a rat's doing this. We are not capable of photosynthesis. Uh, we use only cellular respiration. So we make our energy. Uh, by the way, our cellular energy form is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. You need to know that, ATP. We make ATP. Uh, by breaking down sugars and releasing carbon dioxide. We, we breathe in oxygen, we release carbon dioxide. This is how we break down our, our uh, food intake. Uh, whereas primary producing organisms, they bring in carbon dioxide, they bring in uh, sunlight and uh, make sugars in essence. If you look at these two formulas, they are opposites of one another. This is here, this is there. Okay, good enough. All right, how do we classify life? Uh, we use what's commonly referred to as the Linnaean system of taxonomy. Okay, Linnaean taxonomy. Basically what this does is it looks for similar characteristics between organisms as a, a means of uh, governing their relatability or how related they are to one another. Uh, you can look at my kids and they look a whole lot like me, but if you look at your kids or somebody you know's kids, they probably don't look like me. And there's a reason for that, and that is how related we are genetically, okay? Uh, we do the same thing all up through the animal kingdom, okay? Uh, think about like a tree of life, if you will. For example, hang on, let's throw some stuff out here. Uh, we, we are in Kingdom Animalia, along with many other animals that are not that related to us. Fish are animals. Uh, there are little tiny microscopic organisms that are animals in the grand scheme of things. Uh, there, there are plenty of animals out there. We are also in Phylum Chordata, along with a lot of other animals which are in Phylum Chordata. Uh, chordata simply means that we have a spinal cord. Think about all the critters out there that you know of that have spinal cords. They're all in phylum chordata. We are included in this, okay? And we can run down through this list. We're in class mammalia, okay? Uh, mammalia, mammals, we have hair. We tend to give birth to live offspring. And class, we feed our young milk. Uh, this is class mammalia. Now, we're gonna diverge a little bit. Let's talk about your house, uh, your dog at your house. 
Uh, your dog is in order carnivora. Carnivora is that they eat meat to live. Okay, and they, they have teeth that are reflective of that. Family Canidae, yet again, again, not the teeth. Genus Canis, and then their species is Familiaris. There are other canids that are not in genus Familiaris. Uh, we can play the same game with your house cat. Again, domain eukarya, we are eukaryotic organisms. That means that our, our cells have nuclei within them, a nucleus. Um, we are in kingdom animalia, phylum chordata, we have spinal cords, class mammalia, we have hair, we give birth to live offspring, etc. Order, okay, we are in order with the primates, whereas your house cat is in carnivora. These are the strict meat eaters, whereas we have teeth that are more oriented towards plant eating. Okay, this is sort of how this works. Uh, more uh, omnivorous teeth, if you will. Our, our teeth are set up to be able to do many different things. Uh, family Homonidae versus family Felidae, genus Homo, uh, genus Felis, species Sapiens, species Domesticus. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this, okay? We are alone here, folks. Uh, there are plenty of felid organisms out there, okay? Plenty, plenty, plenty of felids. Uh, no other uh, genus Homo organisms out there. Uh, by the way, just so we can get this out of the way, uh, Homo sapiens means the thinking man. Okay, we're, I guess, a little egocentric. So we have named ourselves a, a smart organism in essence. Okay, Ho, uh, Homo sapiens means thinking man, or uh, the process of thought, if you will. Now, there have been others in genus Homo, like Homo neanderthalensis. Uh, these guys died out probably about 30,000 years ago, but nothing since then. Okay, uh, there are some reports, so if you want to go and look up like Homo naledi, and there's a few more I can't think of offhand that they think may have been around not terribly long ago, but today there, there are no others in genus Homo. So it's kind of neat. It's kind of a neat thing. Yeah, yeah, that'll do. All right, oh, well, I, let me show you this. It's kind of neat. So here is your hand. Here's what the bones in your hand look like. This is the hand of a bat. You will notice that it's got the same basic structure. The bones are just a little bit different. It's a mammalian trait. Or, uh, yeah, it's good enough for me. Okay. Uh, this, as a concept, is important to cover, but it's not something I'm going to really harp on. Okay? Uh, we utilize a very specific method to get at and answer questions in the world around us. We call this the scientific method. And you should have a decent grasp on this going way on back to like seventh grade. Okay, we've probably been in the scientific method for a long time. Um, the idea here is this, and again, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here. In science, if you uh, get a textbook and you read it, good biology textbook or a human biology textbook, which we'll talk about later, um, we must judge things only on the strength of their evidence. What I'm going to present to you in this class is not my opinion. Okay, it's not my opinion. I'm presenting to you the facts as best we understand them by going through a very uh, crucial system called the scientific method to get at answering questions. Okay? What I'm presenting to you is judged off of the strength of its evidence and scientific examination, mostly through hypothesis-driven science. Uh, now, science does come in kind of two ways. There is what's referred to as observational science. Think about this like a, a fishing expedition. You go out and see who's home just to figure out what the story is. And then there is, of course, hypothesis-driven science which is where we use the scientific method. Now, I'm not gonna make you go through and learn all of this stuff. Uh, I feel like your time could be better used elsewhere, but rest assured that this process keeps garbage out of your textbook, okay? Uh, scientific method elucidates problems. And even further than that, uh, if a person, this says I can be in the building today. Irritating me though. If a person uh, conducts a large amount of scientific research, they come up with a very interesting finding in their research, they must put that process or put that, uh, that research through a process referred to as peer review. And this is something that you need to be familiar with. Uh, peer review simply means that any new scientific findings, any new research must be sent out to other professionals in the field and double checked. Okay, this just keeps opinion out. 
Uh, I, I remember not terribly long ago, we, we wrote up this paper about this very simple trapping method to catch freshwater crayfish. They're hard to get, okay? Uh, the burrowing ones is what I'm talking about. They're hard to, hard to catch. Uh, so we developed this trap that was pretty good at catching them. And we wrote up this two or three page paper, very short, very simple. This is an obvious thing. I send it to a journal for publication. They send it out to three or four people that are professionals in the field. Those folks send me any questions they have because they're looking for holes in my work. And it's a wonderful way to keep opinion out of science. Okay, it's a wonderful way to keep opinion out of science. Uh, yeah, let's talk about theories and paradigm shifts. Why not? Uh, so a theory, a scientific theory, is a well-tested and widely accepted explanation. Let's just leave it there. Um, so a theory of gravity. It's not that we think we know kind of a little bit, a theory, like I have a theory. No, no, not that. In science, theory is well tested. Our best answer to the question, our best answer to the question would be considered scientific theory. Now, is that to say that theory, science, can't be mistaken? No. There's been plenty of times where we've had what we refer to as paradigm shifts, a dramatic change in the collective viewpoint in science. Uh, for a long, long time, it was believed that the Earth was the center of the universe and all the heavenly bodies flow around us. Mistaken, mistaken. Now we uh, follow a tenet referred to as heliocentrism. The sun is in the center of our solar system and the planets cycle around that sun and then there's lots of solar systems in just a single galaxy, let alone the universe, okay? So uh, this, the paradigm shifted, okay? the paradigm shifted. Uh, for a long, long time, we believed that people got sick because of imbalances in fluids, their humors in their body, or, or because uh, they were in an area that had poor miasma, it smelled bad in other words. No! Now, now we realize how illness functions. The paradigm shifted. Okay, the paradigm shifted. All right, moving on. Let's get on to the, the important bits of this class and the stuff that matters more so to me. And that is the major themes of it, all right? Uh, feel free to read through this stuff, you know, knock yourself out, but I'm just gonna jump right into it. First thing we gotta do is we gotta define anatomy and physiology, okay? Anatomy is parts and pieces, okay? Parts and pieces. Here's a hand, one, two, three, four, five fingers. That's anatomy, folks but I can pick things up with that hand. I can do things with it. That's physiology, okay? Anatomy is the parts, physiology is the function, okay? Uh, and we can run through a pile of this stuff, man. Like there is in the world around us, we can refer to gross anatomy, that's large things. Uh, histology and cytology would be small things. Histology is looking at tissues. Tissues are groups of cells. Cytology is looking at cells. Yeah, man, so, so looking at little stuff. We could go through different systems within the body. You could refer to this as like systemic anatomy. Like you could study the cardiovascular system as systemic anatomy. But the idea here is that anatomy is the parts, whereas physiology is what they do. We could look at renal physiology. The anatomy would be, and again, you don't have to know this detail, okay? But the anatomy would be like, here's a kidney glomerulus. This would be considered a nephron. There's a proximal convoluted tubule, one of my favorite terms in science, the loop of Henle, and a distal convoluted tubule. And let me tell you, let me tell you, it, it just runs on and on and on. That is anatomy. The physiology is how that kidney pulls certain chemicals out of the bloodstream to keep you homeostatically balanced how those kidneys push certain chemicals into what will become your urine stream to get them out of your system to help you maintain homeostatic balance. This is super important, super important. Uh, muscle physiology, so the anatomy of your what are called myofibrils, you could say that this is actin, this is myosin, you can look at troponin, tropomyosin, and we can play these games, but the physiology is how they lead to muscle contraction. Okay, how they do what they do, that's physiology. And what we tend to find is that the anatomy kind of constrains the physiology. 
Uh, we can see this in the world around us too. I, I got my hammer and my wrench up here. Um, I have tried to drive a nail with a wrench before. Sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, but I've never tried to tighten a bolt with a hammer. The idea is that the hammer and the wrench look a certain way and that governs what they're capable of doing. And the same thing can be said for our anatomical features, like our bones and our teeth. Now on the surface, these look quite similar. If I had a little square of bone and a little square of tooth sitting here in front of us, you'd have a hard time telling me the difference. But the reality is they are quite different indeed. Bone is relatively soft and flexible by comparison. Teeth are very hard and brittle, okay? Uh, bone must be kind of soft to do what it does. Every time you move around, man, let me tell you, your bones, they got a little flex to them, okay? They absorb a little bit of energy from that movement. They have to be able to flex a little bit or you'd be dealing with fractures all the darn time. You don't want that. You want the bones a little bit flexible. Uh, whereas your teeth, must be incredibly hard to deal with the chemicals they come in contact with on a daily basis. Uh, we can go and look at skeletons from uh, arid regions where there's a lot of sand, like Egyptian skeletons are a classic example of this. And they just have the worst teeth ever because their food had a lot of sand in it and the sand wore their teeth down to nubs by the, uh, as they were aging. You want your teeth to be very, very hard and resistant to the world around them at the detriment, unfortunately, that they are prone to fracture, okay? If a, if a tooth cracks, well, well, let me rephrase. Uh, teeth tend to crack all the way through. They don't bend, they don't move uh, like bone does, okay? Whereas teeth fracture. The anatomy constrains the physiology. And we can see that on a microscopic level as well. Uh, so what I have here is from a kidney. You can see this very, very ultra thin line ultra thin line right through there and then by comparison this is from the intestinal tract and you can see a line through here there is a nucleus of a cell and the cell is tall man it's real tall and you line these up and you get a big thick layer over here look at this nucleus 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 the difference is the cells are completely and utterly flat Think about like cracking an egg and dropping it on a frying pan, okay? Completely flat cells. These flat cells in the kidney, real good at filtration. These thick cells here in the intestine, good at keeping potentially dangerous things out. Got a big thick layer. Think about this as like a coffee filter. This is a layer of cardboard. Cardboard's protective, coffee filter lets stuff through. The anatomy, okay? The anatomy constrains the physiology. This is so important, so important. All right, uh, real, real quick, we'll run through the hierarchy of complexity. It's gonna go as follows. <clears throat> you need to be friends with this. You are an organism. As an organism, you are made up of many organ systems. Cardiovascular system, you name it. Digestive system. Uh, those organ systems are made up of individual organs. Those organs are made up of many different tissues. Two or more, I think, is the definition of an organ. Two or more tissues makes up an organ. Those tissues are made up of individual cells. All right, someone here somewhere. Okay. All right, look at that. The study of tissues, what's that called? Histology, okay? Whereas the study of cells would be called cytology, okay? Microscopic. Uh, those cells have individual organelles within them. Those organelles are made up of individual molecules. Those molecules are made up of individual atoms. Ergo, where do we need to start this class? If we're trying to figure out how this thing works, we gotta start down here. All right, let's go here. So these are the organ systems of the body. And what I need you to understand is uh, sort of what they sort of all do. Okay, kind of what they do and exactly in the way I'm gonna phrase it. Not a big deal in other words. Um, what they kinda of do and maybe what parts are associated. This is very simple, you already know most of it. All right, <clears throat> let me just run through these real quick, you'll get my point. The integumentary system, okay? The integumentary system is like your skin, and what your skin is, it's quite protective. It protects you against UV radiation, it protects you against bacteria in the outside world, your integumentary system is protective. Uh, the skeletal system, 
made out of bones, okay? What do your bones do? Uh, they can protect you from impact, like my brain's inside of my skull, and it's very delicate, but luckily I can push against my head and not damage my brain, that's a good thing. Uh, my bones are also mineral storage. It's a storage uh, for phosphates, for potassium. You even store a pretty large amount of fat, adipose energy in essence, in your bones. Uh, the muscular system. So the muscular system is made up of muscles and uh, their main function is to provide for motion so you can move around and do the things that you do. Nervous system, brain and spinal cord. What do the brain and spinal cord do? Well, in the grand scheme of things, their, their function is quite fascinating. They, they allow you to perceive and respond to stimulation, okay? Perceive and respond to stimulation. That's the nervous. Uh, endocrine system is primarily associated with the production of hormones. Uh, so, for instance, your, uh, let's have a good example. The pituitary gland makes growth hormone, makes you grow taller. Uh, your pancreas makes insulin, which is a hormone that regulates your blood sugar levels, as we talked about previously with diabetes. Yeah, man, absolutely important. Endocrine system. Cardiovascular system. Heart, blood vessels, pumps blood around the body, carries nutrients and oxygen, gets rid of waste products and carbon dioxide. Uh, the lymphatic system. Now, believe it or not, the lymphatic system and the cardiovascular system are quite interrelated to one another. Uh, the reality is that your cardiovascular system kind of takes fluid and things all around the body and a little of it gets lost, like in your extremities. And then the lymphatic system picks up that excess fluid and returns it to the body. And along the way, tests it for pathogens, things that are potentially dangerous. Uh, so your lymphatic system plays a role in immunity. Picks up excess tissue fluid, plays a role in immunity. Uh, respiratory system, lungs, tracheal passages, allows you to bring in oxygen for processing. Uh, digestive system, you consume and absorb nutrients. Consume food and absorb nutrients from that food. That is how your digestive system works. Uh, we have a urinary system. What the urinary system does is it processes what we call, are you listening? Nitrogenous waste products, okay? Processes out nitrogenous waste. Um, these are the breakdown products of your general cellular metabolism. So when you're doing the things that you do on a daily basis, living your life, you produce a lot of what are called nitrogenous waste products. Urinary system gets rid of those so they don't turn toxic in your system. Then of course we got male and female reproductive systems. Uh, we'll just keep this simple and say testis and ovaries since they are sort of analogous structures. And to be frank, if I had an ovary in this hand and a testis in this hand, you couldn't tell the difference. They look almost identical, pretty fascinating. Uh, and these are specialized for the, specialized for the production of gametes. Uh, these would be egg and sperm, ergo, these lead to reproductive success. Okay, so our capacity for reproducing ourselves governed by our reproductive systems. And uh, let's see here. You know, I'm gonna vote. That's a good spot for you to take a little break. So if I were you, I'd take a little break, go do something else for a little while, then come back and we're gonna finish this thing up. Minor change in venue. Uh, went to uh, eat lunch, came back, and they are polishing the floors in the previous lecture hall. So here we are in my anatomy room. Uh, let's, let's get to work. Better light. <coughs> Okay, organ systems are integrated. Uh, the idea behind all these organ systems is that they're in fact all sort of together working in, in unison with one another uh, to keep you in homeostatic balance, okay? Uh, your digestive system is bringing in food that gets picked up by your cardiovascular system. It cycles around and kind of feeds your cells and also carries oxygen from the lungs. All of this produces waste products that are filtered out by your urinary system. I mean, they're, they're all interrelated. And again, the key term here is homeostasis. Okay, homeostasis is what we're shooting for. So let's go through and talk about what that means. Now, homeostasis is, let's see, the ability of the body to maintain relatively stable internal conditions by changes in the external environment. It's a fancy way of saying that you wanna keep uh, your internal states roughly the same. Again, think about body temperature, okay? You don't want your body temperature varying too much. 
You, you don't want your blood calcium levels varying too much because it can play all kinds of hell with your nervous system, okay? Uh, so, so we have to maintain a state of sameness. We, we commonly refer to this as dynamic equilibrium, okay? We refer to this as being dynamic equilibrium. Uh, now, full disclosure, it, it, it's not a perfect set state. Uh, if I say that your body temperature is about 98.6, the about is an important word there. So 98.6 might be the average across a day, but at any given moment, it'll be a little higher or a little lower, okay? And when I say a little higher, I mean, you know, like 99, you know, 99, one or two, uh, or, uh, 97, 96. You know, it, it can vary a little bit, but the idea is it's relatively stable. It's in dynamic equilibrium, right? Dynamic equilibrium. <clears throat> now, there's some terms you need to be familiar with here. These terms are afferent and efferent. What will happen is you will go and you will do something and it will augment some steady state within your body. The best way to look at this is temperature. Uh, there will be an imbalance. Your temperature can go up or down. Here, this is me and the wife, pre-kids, living out in Northport back in the day. And uh, this is when it came a huge snow back in like 2000 and, geez, I don't know, call it 12 or 13? Anyway, um, came a big snow. We go outside. Our core body temperatures had to have started to drop. And what will happen is there's some sort of receptor or a sensor in your system that will pick up that the body temperature is dropping. It'll send an afferent message to some sort of control center like your brain, and then your brain will send an efferent message to some sort of effector to bring your core body temperature back up. If you get quite cold, what do you do? Well, you might begin to shiver, okay? You might start to shake and shiver. You can also lead to a whole variety of augmentations in your cardiovascular network. Do I have that on here anywhere? Uh, yeah, I do. Let's talk about it in a second. Uh, Blood sugar, same concept, okay? Blood sugar rises, your body can pick this up, cause the release of insulin, that will be uh, causing a decrease in blood sugar. Same thing with blood sugar. Uh, you can detect a rise in blood sugar, like maybe you just had a dozen donuts. Uh, your body will detect that, release insulin from the pancreas, that will bring your blood sugar levels back down. The idea is relatively constant blood sugar, somewhere between 70 and 92 milligrams per deciliter. Now, an important point to be made in reference to your body temperature is these terms vasodilation and vasoconstriction. When you get very cold, you don't just shiver to warm up. What actually happens is a broad spectrum vasoconstriction across your surface. You see your skin acts like a radiating system. It radiates heat off your body. And if you get very um, hot, for example, your skin, you will have vasodilation. The, the blood vessels that go to your skin will get larger. To dilate means to get larger. And you'll send large amounts of blood into the skin and it'll radiate heat and it'll cool you off. So during the summertime when it's really hot, you vasodilate your blood vessels and uh, it sends lots of blood out to the skin and cools your body down like a radiator. Winter time, like outside right now, or uh, back in the snow I showed you previously, where do you notice the cold first? Into your nose, fingertips, maybe your toes, extremities, arms, legs. Oh yeah, that's because we vasoconstrict, oh hang on, that's because we vasoconstrict the blood vessels that are going out to our extremities when it's very cold. We limit blood flow. Constrict means to get smaller. We limit blood flow to the extremities in order to conserve heat in your core, in your torso. Uh, basically, the idea is you want to keep the heart and the brain working. You can lose some fingers and survive. Okay? So that's how this works. Uh, if it drops too much, you go to hypothermia, and that's a major problem. <clears throat> now, you can end up with all sorts of problems when these feedback mechanisms cease to work. Uh, one of these is acromegaly, uh, also gigantism. These are very related. Uh, disorders. This guy is abnormally tall. This lady is of normal size. Uh, this is a feedback problem where the brain has been producing entirely too much growth hormone for entirely too long. Uh, so these systems are very important. Now, everything we've been talking about, all of this, this has all been, um, hang on, technical difficulties. Everything we've been talking about here, this has been in reference to negative feedback systems. Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, your blood sugar rises, so you release insulin to bring it back down. 
your body temperature drops, so you shiver to bring it back up. It's negative feedback. Your blood calcium levels uh, dip, so your body takes steps to pull that blood calcium back up. Uh, you go anoxic, so you breathe in order to increase the oxygen content in your body. They're negative feedback. Something gets up too high, your body takes steps to bring it back down. Something gets down too low, your body takes steps to bring it back up. Negative feedback. There are also positive feedback systems, uh, depending upon the scale of time you look at, eh, it's kind of eh, uh, in your system, okay? Positive feedback is possible, but typically it's on a short term. There are a couple of good examples of this. One of these is blood clotting. If I cut myself in my metal shop, <clears throat> cut myself in my metal shop, drip, 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 blood, drip, 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 clot, okay? The idea is you bleed, you bleed less, you bleed less, and eventually you get a blood clot uh, that, that stops you from bleeding. What actually is happening here is there are chemicals inside the walls of your blood vessels, and when those chemicals come into contact with platelets, those platelets release uh, special chemicals that recruit more platelets. So platelets help you to clot blood, okay? To clot a, a an opening to, to seal an opening within a blood vessel. So the platelets are flooding out and they pick up this chemical so they stick together and then they release more chemicals which causes more platelets to come in and stick together and then that releases even more chemical which causes more platelets to come in. The idea is a few platelets, a few platelets leads to more platelets, leads to more platelets, leads to more platelets until blood clot, you stop bleeding. Okay. Another good way to look at this is pregnancy and delivery. Okay, uh, there's a very unique system here. It's a uh, combined effect of the endocrine system, which produces what? Hormones. And the nervous system, which senses augmentations within the body. Okay, uh, what will happen here is a response between uh, the cervix, a hormone called oxytocin, and nervous impulses that continue up to the brain. Now remember, what we're trying to do here is have positive feedback and amplification, if you will. And how this works is as follows. Um, if a lady goes to a, um, a doctor about to deliver a child, the first thing they ask, again, I got three, is how far apart are your contractions? Okay, how far apart are your contractions? Uh, and the reason for this is very simple. When the kid's head pushes down against the cervix, it sends a nervous transmission up to the brain. That nervous transmission in the brain causes the pituitary gland to release a hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin travels through the bloodstream, gets down to the uterus, and causes the uterus to contract and then relax. Okay? That pressure from the uterus pushes the kid's head down against the cervix, which sends another signal up to the brain, which causes the release of more oxytocin, which leads to a stronger uterine contraction, which leads to more pressure against the cervix, which leads to more nervous transmissions to the brain, more oxytocin, and the system just ramps and ramps and cranks and cranks and closer and closer together until developmental biology. You got another kid on your hands. That is positive feedback, okay? In the grand scheme of things, that's positive feedback, and that's how it works. That's good enough for me. All right, uh, that's gonna take us to chemistry.